Ya estamos en casi mediodía en Chile. A nombre de la Facultad de Ciencias Jurídicas y Sociales de la Universidad Austral de Chile y del Círculo de Estudios de Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos, CEDIR, les damos nuevamente una cordial bienvenida. El día de hoy y agradecemos su participación en esta actividad que está marcada por una conferencia magistral. En pocos momentos la iniciaremos y vamos a indicar nuevamente que estamos transmitiendo por las plataformas Zoom, YouTube de la cuenta del CEDIT y en Facebook en la cuenta Derecho.Universidad Austral de Chile. Los asistentes a esta sesión por Zoom deberán seleccionar en el canal de audio la modalidad español para poder escuchar la traducción simultánea. En tanto, las personas que están viendo esta transmisión a través de las plataformas YouTube y Facebook Live van a poder acceder al video con subtítulos en español en las próximas horas cuando ya este video pueda ser descargado. Sin más entonces, dejo con ustedes al codirector del CEDI, de este centro, de este círculo de estudios de Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos, don Esteban Oyarzún Gómez. Muchas gracias Alejandra. Voy a presentar al profesor Ducinas, a quien agradezco muchísimo por haber aceptado la invitación y por estar presente en el día de hoy. Costas Ducinas es profesor de Derecho y director fundador, de, director fundador del Verbach Institute for the Humanities de la Universidad de Londres. Educado en Atenas, Londres y Estrasburgo, el doctor Ducinas es editor en jefe de Law and Critic y de la editorial Verbach Law Press. Fue elegido miembro del Parlamento Helénico en 2015 y fue presidente del Comité Parlamentario Permanente de Defensa Nacional y Relaciones Exteriores entre 2015 y 2019. Es el presidente del Instituto Nikos Pulanzas. Costas ha escrito extensamente sobre filosofía jurídica y política, derechos humanos, estética, literatura, arte y teoría crítica. Entre sus numerosos libros se incluyen Jurisprudencia Postmoderna, Justicia Abortada, Derecho y Psicoanálisis, el fin de los derechos humanos, derechos humanos e imperio, entre muchos otros. Sus libros han sido traducidos a más de eh, 12 idiomas. Escribe para varios periódicos y sitios web, incluidos The Guardian y Open Democracy. Doctor Ducinas, muchísimas gracias por haber aceptado la invitación y tiene su tiempo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Thank you very much, everyone uh, at the university for this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk to you. And I appear to you as a ghost, as an apparition on a screen, a shadow theater. And I think it is symbolic of our ghostly times of illness, of a permanent state of exception, of the withdrawal of rights, but also of the ghost of resistance buried in all constitutions. And it is strange that the physical distanciation that we have to follow out of solidarity and social responsibility paradoxically brings us together in this wonderful conference. You in Chile and many other places, myself on the small Greek island of Poros close to Athens from which I'm teaching my classes at the University of London. But there is more that brings us together the new age of resistance against social injustice and political repression. You, the Chileans, and we, the Greeks, resisted together in the 1970s against the dictatorship. But there is also another similarity. Next week, you will be voting in a referendum about the change of the constitution. As a politician, as a, an elected member of parliament, for the first ever, radical left government in Europe, I was involved in changing our own post-dictatorship constitution, and therefore I would be very happy to discuss this experience of changing a right-wing constitution, a neoliberal constitution, to create something for the 21st century. Indeed, we will be looking at Chile eh, on the 18th of October and next week, and the whole world will be looking uh, at what is happening 
in your wonderful country. It could not be otherwise because humanity is born in acts of disobedience. Adam and Eve defy God's command and leave the garden of heaven for a veil of tears. Prometheus steals fire from the Olympian gods and gives it to humans starting civilization. Sigmund Freud's myth of the birth of morality has a brand of brothers killing their father and creating ethics out of the guilt uh, that arose for this Oedipal murder. But even in religion, if you look at uh, uh, St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, he writes, is the law sin? I had not known sin, but for the law. For I had not known lust, except when the law said, thou shalt not covet. Gods and mythical legislators are created to give us laws and prohibitions. And these give rise to desire and of course, the violation of desire. Man is born in acts of disobedience, of defiance and resistance. Turning to modernity, resistance and revolution led to most of the freedoms we take for granted. The emancipation of slaves, universal suffrage, restrictions on the brutal exploitation of working people, basic rights for women and minorities. Take away resistance from the history of the last two centuries and we would still be living in some kind of Hobbesian nightmare. This is a great time to discuss resistance, particularly with friends in Chile. In my book, Philosophy and Resistance in the Crisis, which I published three or four years ago, I argued that in 2010, history started again. The end of history idea came itself to an end. The whole world entered a new age of resistance from the Arab Spring to the European and American occupations, from the great protests of May 25, 18 in Santiago, from Athens to Rio de Janeiro, Hong Kong, and Black Lives Matter, the next great protest is around the corner. We don't know where or when it will happen, but we know that it will. But is there a right to revolution and resistance? The first part of my talk will deal with the philosophy uh, of uh, revolution and the right to revolution. The second, at law's response, at the legal response, what the law says. The third will be a brief examination of civil disobedience. And the final will take parts of this analysis in order to start developing an alternative theory of human rights. Let me start with a quick a clarification of some of the terms I will use. Occasionally, I'm using the terms resistance, rebellion, and revolution as if they were the same. Of course, they are very different. A revolution, that is radical socio-political change, starts, however, with acts of disobedience, followed by mass resistance and rebellion. Protest, individual disobedience, collective resistance, and revolution form an uneven continuum. However, the emotional, physical, and normative pressure people feel when they stand up to power are similar, even though the form of action and the outcome of resistance may differ. For the law, however, rights belong to individuals. They're individual rights. The will, the intention to resist and rebel, therefore, is more important than the end of the resistance, which could be either revolution or, more often, the prison. Let me start with philosophy. Now, the right to revolution is a cause of philosophical embarrassment. It has been discussed extensively, of course, in the 18th and 19th century by German idealism, uh, by Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, and all of them welcomed the French Revolution. They believed that the French Revolution introduced freedom into history and moved humanity to a higher level. At the same time, their theory of law made them reject the right to rebel. 
Kant, for example, was enthusiastic about the French Revolution, so much that some people called him the old Jacobin. However, in his late political uh, argues, argued that the celebration of the revolution by the world public opinion was evidence of the moral progress of humanity. But then turning to the right to revolution, he dismissed it out of hand. It would be an obvious contradiction, he writes, if the constitution included a law entitling the people to overthrow the existing constitution from which all particular laws derive. Respect for law should be extended, should be given even to constitutions affected by injustice for any legal constitution, even if only in small measure lawful and just, is better than none at all. Hannah Arendt sarcastically comments in Eichmann in Jerusalem that Kant's categorical imperative following this statement that even unjust constitutions should be obeyed, the categorical imperative should be act as if the principle of your actions was the same as that of the legislator or of the law of the land. Of course, this was the main defense of war criminals in Nuremberg, of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, of the defendants in the International Criminal Court trials. It is the perfect maxim, says Arendt, for the household use of the little man who obeys the law without any moral or political doubt. But we can agree that a lawful revolu revolution for Kant is impossible and prohibited. The law cannot accept its own overthrow and therefore it must ban and prevent revolution. Hegel too rejected a legal right to revolution. For him, a right is individual will, recognized, justified by law and enforced and enforceable by the law. Therefore, a legal right should be asserted without risk. Disobedience and rebe rebellion, on the other hand, are risky. Therefore, they cannot be a legal right. But Hegel too celebrated every revolution, the English, the American, the Dutch, the French, even the Haitian revolution uh, when, uh, on which he based his master and slave dialectic in their phenomenology. In Hegel's philosophy of history, the necessity of revolution emerges in reality. When an established social order has outlived its purpose, it will be swept aside in a combination of historic necessity and uh, action and political action, because the, uh, an example is the French Revolution, the drive of the enlightenment of the new ideas against feudalism and against uh, the monarchical uh, state had deprived the socio-political system of its raison d'etre. The revolution simply completed the task by removing uh, the king. Historical necessity leads to revolution. The revolution explodes illegally and becomes legitimate post factum after the event, if it succeeds. History therefore justifies what the law prohibits. The legitimacy of the rebel derives from historical and social conditions, not from legal or constitutional rules. So the philosophical position seems clear. Resistance and revolution are illegal, criminal. But once the revolution has overthrown the old order, the ancien regime, the new law deserves the same obedience, the same protection as the old order that it defeated and replaced. Success, therefore, a question of fact, changes the legal position, the normative position retrospectively. Whether one is a great criminal or a revolutionary hero depends on two sets of relations. First, a temporal between temporal relation, a time relationship between present and future. Second, a normative one between law and fact. 
for legal positivism, those of you who study law, I'm sure you know about positivism, rules of law are legislated before the facts that they later come to regulate. Facts, on the other hand, are ontologically so solid. They are certain and they can be ascertained through rules of evidence. But the temporal priority of law and objectivity of facts is often challenged even in law. Take the legal doctrine of void legal acts. A void contract is null from the beginning and cannot be enforced. A contract to kill someone, a contract to sell cocaine, or the marriage of a bigamist are all void. When this nullity has been declared, it is as if the contract had never happened. Its effects are eliminated, but reality may have changed. The assassination may have taken place. The cocaine may have been snorted. We can say that the contract is a performative speech act, an agreement between parties that changes the world through our, uh, our discussion, our talking, our agreement, the offer and the acceptance come together and the world is changed. A later declaration of nullity of this contract goes back and deletes what legally happened. A successful revolution is a mirror image of the same operation. It deletes the legal record, changing criminality and making it lawfulness. Crime may, is made it right. The criminal is made a hero, but right from the start, right from the very beginning, right from the point at which she was a criminal. When a contract is avoided, annulled, the law negates what happened in reality. In the revolution, reality negates what the law ordered. The revolution does not redress the effects of the law as mercy or amnesty does with criminal, criminals, it negates and reverses the law itself. We can call this the normative force of the real, how reality, how what is happening changes the law <coughs> and changes the law radically because it obliterates the earlier legal position retrospectively, as well as all the conditions that led to it. At the moment of the revolution, two alternatives exist, success or failure. Failure confirms what exists, the old regime, and the old regime survives. Success, on the other hand, at the point of the rebellion, is a pure potential, it's virtue. It negates what exists and creates, however, a new order once it has succeeded. And that success goes to the very beginning. If the revolution succe succeeds, the potential, the virtual, becomes actual. The new regime will have been both normatively authorized, in other words, both moral and legal, right from the very start. So the dissident, the resistor, operates at two levels. She acts now as if the new law she wants to start, to inaugurate, was already applicable. She exercised her right to resist as if the rebellion had been already successful and has changed what appears as crime and sedition into right and duty and the new world. Fact and law, revolution and right are therefore closely intertwined. The time arrow is reversed. In this sense, every rebellion is and will have been the exercise of the right to revolution. Right and revolution are not antithetical, but coeval. We can call this the right to the event, a right whose status as moral or legal, as ideal or real actual is ambiguous because it changes from one to the other and unsettles both temporality, the time sequence, and legality, turning what was crime into 
right. So the right to the event, banned and declared impossible by the law, keeps returning as the only quasi-natural right. But there is more. The philosophical rejection of the right uh, to rebel does not tell the full story. Hegel, of all people, explores in many places potential bridges between legal right, resistance, and the consciousness, the consciousness of modernity, what we call subjectivity. Property plays a key role in the emergence of subjectivity for Hegel. The modern legal system protects the right to property and supports contracts. But this right and contract offers something more than what I want to get from someone else in a contract. The legal person as a owner and as a contractor is recognized for what is common in all of us, our universal humanity, despite our many differences. The abstract universalism of law turns us into formally equal persons. But despite this, Hegel rejects an absolute right to property. Property can be violated to prevent the total loss of rights. A starving man, a very poor man, has the right to steal in order to survive. And by analogy, the poor have the right to have an acceptable level of material life and can act on it. Theft is unlawful in those situations, but not wrong. Why? The, why, according to Hegel, I mean, the poor, like everyone else, have a formal right to property. But the lack of basic material resources, the fact that they don't have money, they don't have a house, they are starving, does not allow them to enjoy that formal right to property. And this split between the formal right to own things and the inability to own anything, undermines their dignity. Their identity is split between this abstract right of the legal person that has all these recognitions and the concrete degradation of a life of dependency. Therefore, the poor have a right to steal and violate another's property in order to survive. And there is more. It is precisely the crime of theft the negation of law by the poor that helps move the law from its formal and abstract state, the state that protects just property and contracts, to the more concrete state of political and economic rights. Revolution and crime are the motors both of history and law. And this is Hegel, it is not Marx, it is actually the old teacher of Marx that basically made revolution and a kind of crime, theft by the property less, the way through which history moves. Let me move now quickly to the legal right to revolution. Modernity and rights, individual rights, legal rights, human rights later, emerge only through revolution. The 18th century revolutions of course, were retrospectively legitimated by the manifestos of modernity, the French Declaration, and the American uh, Declaration of Independence. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights, states the first article of the French Declaration, repeated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then adds these rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression a right that it is there in the French Declaration, but of course not in the Universal Declaration. In the United States too, the revolutionary birth of the country, of the state, led to a very healthy respect for resistance and revolution. When in the course of human events, writes the, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, with the English in this case, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off a despotic government. Indeed, this 
respect uh, for the right to revolution is obvious in the second amendment to the American constitution, the right to bear arms and, uh, and to create militias, which looks back to the American revolution. And today of course has become the cause, the second amendment of the murderous states of American cities, but it started from a very different perspective. So both French and Americans respected and indeed put in their constitutions the right to revolution, the right to resistance. But victorious revolutionaries are the greatest enemies of the right to revolution because of course they know that its exercise can be highly effective. They have carried it out. The 1795 version of the French Declaration eliminated the right to resistance from the four basic rights. In America, the passing of the constitution marked the end of the revolutionary period. And as an important commentator, Harvey Mansfield put it, the right to revolution appears embarrassingly naive and rhetorical. An awkward enthusiasm of youth, of our young revolution, the young republic, best wrapped in quotation marks and put away in the attic. A similar, I think, trajectory can be detected in the human rights tradition. Natural rights and le droit de l'homme, the rights of man and le droit de l'homme in France, started as tools and signs of revolutionary will. Human rights have become defense mechanisms against revolution. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 and the European Convention of Human Rights, equally I think the American as well, have no place for the right to resistance. The preamble of the Universal Declaration states that rights are essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny. For the historian Samuel Moyne, and I recommend his book, The Last Utopia, human rights were created after the war to prevent radical change and were presented as a substitute for the defeated traditions of social justice, for socialism and all that kind of tradition. Indeed, the leaders and great philosophers, theorists of the decolonization struggles, Gandhi, Fanon, and Krumah and Messeze did not use the uh, language of human rights in their struggle. Indeed, they dismissed human rights, which they thought was part of the mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission that the white Europeans always uh, uh, imposed, carried out supposedly in the colonies. Now, of course, you don't need to be uh, radical to realize that the law formalizes the dominant will in a state. Law and order is about the protection of the social order and the protection of public order. Yet the attempt to delete resistance from history and the, the attempt to uh, make the right to resistance, uh, to exclude it from the law was doomed to fail. International law gives recognition to a victorious revolution following Kant on this occasion. In domestic law, civil disobedience has become the heir of the right to resistance and the ground where the toleration of law is tested. So let me say a few words about civil disobedience, first in philosophy, then in law. The philosophical attack on the right to resistance and legal positivism led to its exclusion from the texts of law and constitutions. Civil disobedience entered the public sphere, became part of discussion and great, uh, great controversy in the 1960s with the many protests in Europe, in the United States, and of course, in Latin America. Nonviolent protests marches and demonstrations were considered at the time an extension of the right of experience, the, uh, uh, sorry, the right of expression, the right to free speech. 
Civil disobedience, on the other hand, involves an element of law breaking, but its difference from resistance is great. A right to resistance revolution assumes that we have an ideal which stands higher than the existing law and which can lead us to confront and can encourage us to confront established power. Disobedience, on the other hand, with the emphasis on civility, civil disobedience, seeks the justification and force in, for civil disobedience in the constitution and the law. The revolutionary, the rebel, appeals to another legality. The disobedient protester asks for the existing legality to be observed. So let us look quickly at the theory of civil disobedience as it developed mainly in the United States. Liberal philosophers consider that the most important duty of the state is to protect individual rights and of course, uh, mainly property. Disobedience therefore is justified only if policies and laws of the state violate the principles of equal liberty for John Rawls or basic rights for Ronald Dworkin. John Rawls, an important political philosopher, American political philosopher, constructs a set of conditions that disobedience must meet in order to be excused by the law. The law breaking involved in disobedience must be motivated by respect for the rule of law. It must be undertaken as a last resort. It must not be violent and it must appeal to society's sense of justice as incorporated in the constitution and the legal system. So disobedience to the letter of the law is a way of obeying its spirit if the government has started violating the principles of the law, particularly uh, the right to property and civil liberties. Now, old and recent dissidents have not accepted these preconditions. The rebelling students of 1968, the feminists, the campaigns against nuclear armaments, the mass protests against the communist states, recently the protests against the obscene inequalities of neoliberalism, attacked state politics and the fundaments of the social order as many times are included in the constitution and the law. This kind of activity, this age of resistance we live in has led to the creation of a new theory of democratic disobedience which confronts the kind of decline of our political systems, the delegitimation of our politicians. An anti-democratic, morally unacceptable or unauthorized by the people policy does not become automatically legitimate according to the theory of democratic disobedience because parliament has enacted it. Parties in parliament, try to change the law, to repeal the law, to replace it. People in the street continue this fight with other means, protesting, uh, assembling, and in any way they can, trying to pressurize politicians to change the law. So democratic disobedience is, I think, extremely important because as we know, our democracies have, have atrophied they have decayed. We have entered uh, what is being called here in Europe a post-political age, an age in which technocrats have taken over, politicians have been sidelined or they ask the technocrats for the solutions and people have been totally marginalized and their views uh, are not being taken uh, care at all. Unlike civil disobedience, Democratic disobedience is a collective act. And following Republican theory, it prioritizes the democratic will of the people ahead of fundamental rights. Justified disobedience erupts when a large number of citizens realize that the democratic process malfunctions 
and major policy decisions seriously affecting their lives have no democratic or moral legitimacy. Democracy survives in that sense because it has an integral insurrectionary moment, a, a term used by Etienne Balibar, a great uh, French philosopher, that democracy has both its standard way of operating parties, votes, parliaments, and so on, but it also has in itself, in its basis, an element of insurrection that saves the formal democracy from decay, decline, and atrophy. Now, if we briefly turn now to law, the reaction to disobedience moves on a spectrum from very limited acceptance to total rejection. At one end, disobedience becomes mainly a defense against conviction or is offered really in mitigation in sentencing to try to uh, reduce uh, the sentence of the disobedient who has been found guilty. More often, the law treats disobedience as a normal criminal offense and does not pay any attention to the motives of the protesters. However, the most common response, as I'm sure you know in uh, Chile and we know very well here in Europe, the most common legal response is to see disobedience as a threat to the social order. The dissidents are demonized by courts and the media and receive harsh sentences for deterrence. Disobedience case law, what the courts do, is primarily an ideological case law. Prosecutions freeze a particular event, someone throwing a, a, a stone or someone else, uh, you know, sort of in some way blocking uh, uh, entrance, uh, access to a particular building, they freeze this event, focus on the individuals involved, and they do not refer at all at the mass character of the action or the purpose, why people do it. They totally disregard the motives of the protesters. Ideological and political struggles turn into technical legal disputes apparently, and lose their collective character and political impulse. It does not matter. Resistance is first and foremost a fact, an event, not a moral obligation, and it does not necessarily suffer from legal rejection. It is not the idea of justice, equality, or communism that leads to resistance, but a sense of injustice, the bodily reaction to hurt, hunger, indignation, despair. The idea of justice and equality indeed survive or disappear as a direct result of the existence and the extent of acts of resistance. Resistance is a law of being. It is internal to its object. From the moment being, any kind of being, any kind of relation, takes a form, it encounters resistances which irreversibly twist and separate and fissure that relations. In this sense, whatever the legal impediments and punishments, resistance emerges every time that people say enough is enough. We cannot take it anymore. And I think at this point and for the last 10, 15 years, people all over the world have been saying enough is enough. We cannot take it anymore without necessarily agreeing on any one ideology, on any one particular result that they want to achieve. Let me finish then with a couple of words about human rights more generally. The apparent contradiction and link, deeper link between law and history points perhaps to the existence of two different sources of legal right and individual will. German idealism, as we saw, resolved the tension by distinguishing right and revolution ontologically. Right belongs to law, revolution to the grand historical trajectory, to history. But is a right to revolution, as I explain it, a proper right? Historically, the first claim to a legal right 
was that of the property owner, starting from Roman law, moving on to the Middle Ages, specifically the claim of the creditor against the debtor. This model of right between two parties, the property owner or the creditor and the debtor, migrated then in the Middle Ages from private to public law, and then in the 18th century to the relationship between citizen and state, natural rights, later civil and political rights, and socioeconomic rights. The eternal return of resistance, despite the attempt to ban it, indicates that right perhaps has two sources. A legal right is a right, is a publicly recognized individual will. Rights are individual. So a legal right is a publicly recognized individual will, which finds itself as part, at ease, at peace with the world. But there is secondly another right, a will that wills that wants what does not exist, a will that finds its effect, its place in the world, not fully determined by what the law says. This second right is founded contra fatum, against fate, against destiny, against what has been ordered. It is the right of those people who go out in the streets and they say, we want this, we want that, or we reject this or that. It is a right in a perspective where the world is still open and cannot be fully determined by economic, political, and military might, force, although, of course, they can do great harm to people resisting. These two conceptions of universal right confront each other. On the one side, an acceptance of the social order that has been dressed with the dignity of the law. It is a legal right, it's a constitutional right, perhaps it is a human right. We read about it in the books. The second, however, sense of a universal right is founded on a will which is created by a division of the world, with a division that separates the rulers from the ruled and from those who are excluded. This will is nourished by the distance between formal right and equality on the one hand and the obscene inequality that the legal system uh, tolerates and reproduces. Legal rights enforce the will of individuals. The second type of right matures when there is a collective cry of we, the people. As long as the dissidents ask for this or that reform, this or that concession, the state can accommodate them, sometimes with difficulty. When, however, the will of the people no longer accepts existing social relations and their legal codification, disobedience becomes a collective emancipatory will. The right of resistance can be written off constitutions and bills of rights, but cannot be whisked away. Like the, the, the violence of the origins of the state, which is buried in the constitutional text. I talked about the ghost of the constitutional text. There is the violence of every state at the beginning of the state has been buried in the constitutional text. Like that violence, indeed, the right to resist is also a ghost in the constitution. It eternally returns like a repressed but undeletable moral command that supports all other rights. Without the right to resistance, law becomes ossified, sclerotic, moribund. And this is the reason that every deletion, every rejection, every attempt to stop and to ban and prevent resistance is bound to fail. We can conclude, therefore, that rights are about recognition and distribution about soul and matter, about some kind of material distribution and some re recognition of our identity. Identity and recognition and distribution for individuals and for communities. Except that additionally, there is also 
an indelible right to resistance and to protest, which may not appear in the constitutions, but it is precisely what makes constitutions survive. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish you, uh, I know that uh, later this week, there is the anniversary of 18 October. Uh, I wish you uh, all success with your struggles. And of course, if the referendum next week is um, successful and a new constitution is about to be written, certainly our experience of trying to rewrite a radical constitution in Greece would be extremely useful. Thank you very much again. Muchas gracias, doctor Ducinas. Dejo a continuación con ustedes a Camila Herrera para dar paso a la ronda de preguntas. Um, ok, uh, I'm going to read um, the questions that arrived to our chat. Um, the same, the first question says, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. Sure. Very well. Um, okay, uh, the first question is from an anonymous person and asks, what do you think that in Chile some right-wing sectors insist that some left sectors must condemn some common crimes with the same force that uh, human rights um, violation? Can you repeat it, please? Uh, okay, of course. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the first question says, what do you think that in Chile, some right-wing sex sectors insist that some left sectors must condemn some common crimes with the same force that a human rights violation? Okay, that the, that the left must uh, condemn the crimes. Uh, is yes, that, with sorry, the same but... force, with the same intense force. Uh, listen, crimes are crimes. There's no doubt about that. And therefore, a crime is a question of, uh, of the law. Uh, now, looking at history, uh, and of course, only yesterday here in Greece, a neo-Nazi supposed political party that had uh, received 7% in the previous elections was found to be a criminal organization, a, a gangster, a mob, a, 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 a group of gangsters. Now, this was a political party. This was neo-Nazi, uh, referred directly to Hitler and the Nazis and so on. If we look certainly in the Western European tradition, it is not the left that has committed uh, crimes. It is the right wing that has committed crimes. However, to the extent that we live in a democratic state, to the extent that there is an element of democracy in the way our state operates, of course, a crime is a crime. I mean, terrorism, uh, whether it comes from so-called leftists or more often here in Europe from uh, right-wing and jihadists has to be condemned. But I think it is wrong, totally wrong to equate the left and the right as being two extremes. There is no comparison between the two. The right wants a pure nation. They want to exclude everyone who does not fit into their idea of what a Chilean nation should be like, or a Greek nation or a German nation for that matter. The left, even when it is totally wrong in the tools it uses, has an idea of a universal humanity. They may do all kinds of wrong things, but they never, the left, believe as an ideology, as a theory. I'm not talking about some crazy guys, that they never believe that you have to eliminate people just before, because they are not white, they are not Christian, they are not of the same race uh, like we are. So I agree that crimes and terrorism must be condemned, 
but I don't think that we should equate the left and the right. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. There is another question from an anonymous person as well, and it says, what do you think about President Piñera after he gave his support to the police man who throw and pull off of a seven meter bridge a 16 year old guy in the context of the demonstrations in Chile? I mean, it is obvious, there's nothing to say much about this. You know, the whole world was shocked um, by this event. And I believe that this event in itself, going back to what I was arguing, I think is enough cause for people to go out and protest and resist and ask you know, for uh, a, a pretty uh, fast change of government. I think when in a great nation like Chile that has suffered so much under Pinochet, something like that happens, I think it makes the, the rest of the world that follows very closely uh, the Chilean uh, suffering in the 70s and what has happened more recently, I think the whole world is shocked. I think that a president, a prime minister, a politician who supports this act enters, I'm afraid, you know, the group of people like uh, Bolsonaro and Trump and our own uh, Boris Johnson. I think it is totally unacceptable. And here, the defense of human rights becomes extremely important. Okay, uh, thank you so much for your answer. And um, I think we have another question left that says, Professor, do you think that the changes to the parliament and laws are enough to considering the existence of some extreme right sectors who have defended the actual status of their privileged position? It depends. I mean, this was a big question uh, here in Europe over political parties, in, in our case, in Greece, this so-called uh, Golden Dawn uh, uh, organization that was found by the court to be a criminal organization, a gang, really, uh, whether uh, such uh, parties uh, should be banned or not. My general view is that if any political party organization is seen to carry out activities that are criminal, then they should be banned. However, ideologies should be allowed. It seems to me that fascism and Nazism or an extreme kind of uh, Stalinism it is better to be as part of the public discourse so we can answer to it, so we can try and win minds. But if there is a passage from violent uh, words and violent ideas to the beginning of violent acts, then they do not have part in the democracy. Democracy has to defend its own existence against those people who are totally against the democratic traditions of the people. Okay, thank you sorry, very much. Um, we have two more questions who just arrived. Uh, one is from Esteban and he says, what do you think about um, Donald Trump's words about exalting the white power? Uh, the answer is Black Lives Matter. And Black Lives Matter, not because Blacks or other minorities, Latinos and so on, uh, demand to be power, force, to impose their will upon others, but because America, I'm sorry to say, and American law that I know very well, was built on slavery and the effects of slavery are still evident even in its current political and legal system. So someone who, has, who, who, who talks about white power is not speaking from a position of protest or resistance. The American state was a state in which the whites 
were always the dominant force. The wives and of course men, the male sex were the dominant force. And while the American legal system has created a number of uh, theories, doctrines, a legal case law uh, that has tried to deal with the problem, as we knew uh, historically and legally, and as we now know uh, from what has happened over the last um, 10 years, the remains, the remnants of slavery and discrimination and Jim Crow are still there. So it's not about white power, it is about actually giving dignity and respect to blacks, to African-Americans, to women, to minorities, to Latinos, all those people who work and build America. But of course, as we know now with the pandemic, because they are poor, because they do not have the basic amenities of rich white people, they die, they get the disease more often, they died in much greater numbers. The disease has shown that inequality it is, is not just a moral problem. Inequality kills. White power kills. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. And we have another question that says, why is that it, despite the human rights movement having been around for almost a century, we still see such great violations of human rights, even in democratic countries like Chile? Uh, first of all, the human rights movement started in the 1970s. I mentioned earlier the book by Samuel Moyne, The Last Utopia, which is a history of human rights, which I think in great detail explains uh, why uh, human rights is a relatively recent phenomenon. It did not even start with the Universal Declaration. Then I would like also to mention uh, one of my own books, The End of Human Rights, which exists in Spanish. It was translated and has been, uh, has been in, uh, in Spanish in Colombia, The End, uh, El Fin de Lejos uh, Humanos, in which I try to explain that human rights have two aspects. One part of it is precisely to help people against uh, oppressive dictatorial governments government to help people to have a dignified right. However, human rights have also been used by governments, particularly over the last 20 years, as a way through which, on the one hand, equality remains formal. It does not become real material equality. So social and economic rights are of no great importance. But secondly, in the wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, in Libya, in Syria, in some of the, uh, the, the, the acts of uh, leaders like Bolsonaro and so on in Brazil, we see that human rights can be used to promote the rights of corporations, the rights of property, and not the rights of ordinary people. So human rights is a double, a genius concept. One part of it is helping people. The other part of it can be used against it. To that extent, human rights are full of paradoxes. Our job and our business as students, as academics, as uh, campaigners is precisely to try and push the human rights tradition and practice towards its good, its white part, because there is also a black side to the moon. And this is what keeps human rights from actually uh, becoming the emancipatory force that we hope they are. Thank you so much. And we have another question from Spain that is from Ellen. And she asks, how do you explain that in the human rights century with great conventions and international instruments, we, see, we still see human rights vulnerations even more serious than before these instruments uh, existed. So uh, can you repeat the first part, please? Uh, I didn't fully understand it. Okay, of course. How do you explain that in the human rights century with great conventions and international instruments, 
we still see human rights vulnerations even more serious than before these instruments existed. Okay, it is a, co a continuation of the previous question and I'll answer it in a slightly different way. You have all these human rights conventions, treaties, the declaration, of course, 1948. You have even human rights courts, human rights commissions, and all the rest of it. But of course, there is a huge difference between what an international commission, treaty, convention, or even a constitution says, and what is happening in actual practice. As I said in my talk, it was part of uh, my criticism uh, uh, that leads to resistance, is that the right to property is a formal right. We have the right to property. But if you don't have money, you cannot exercise the right to property. Similarly, the right to work exists in a number of declarations, the universal declaration, in conventions, treaties, the, the international treaties of the international labor organization, ILO. And when I start my lectures in constitutional law and human rights in London, I tell my students, I read all these statements about the right to work, and then I turn around and say, how many of you are unemployed? 25%, that was a couple of years ago, of young people in Britain are unemployed, 60% in Greece. So what is the reason for that? The reason for that is that there is a huge discrepancy between what international law treaties say and what is happening on the ground. And there's nothing that the law itself can do to change that. It is a question of political and social change. It is a question of a new legal, political, social system. The laws are there, the constitutions are there, but the law and the constitution, the human rights, treaties and conventions cannot change what is happening in the world if there is no political push, political movement, campaigns, protests from the ground. The law on its own cannot save us. Okay, thank you, Professor. And Paulina Pino asked, Professor, there are extreme right sectors that organize to exercise physical violence over Protestants and people from left sectors sheltering in the concept of civil, civil disobedience. Do you think that this is, this, uh, this is civil disobedience? So there is cyber civil disobedience. Cyber. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, the, the cyber space has become uh, a space where the crazies, uh, the deniers, of existence, of the pandemic, the flat earthers, those people who believe that the earth is flat, have found a way to disseminate their views. It is part of fake news, but it is also being used against people who are protesting for their rights. It is a major problem. Uh, the cyberspace has opened a number of questions that we thought were to a certain extent resolved, questions about freedom of speech, about the banning of hate speech, about a kind of regulation that allows an exchange and even a really vigorous exchange, an antagonistical exchange, but does not move on to bullying, on to stalking, on to really uh, uh, um, destroying people's lives. So I think it is terribly important to have a regulation of the cyberspace. However, at this point, governments around the world and the international institutions seem to forget this thing. And regulation has been left to Facebook, to Google, to Twitter, to those major organizations. I think this is going to be a major issue in the next few years when it becomes clear that extreme right-wing bullying and cybercrime with the fake news of the deniers of truth have created a pretty toxic combination that I think does not allow a democracy to survive. Thank you, Professor. And this is the last question from Eduardo Cárcamo. He asks, 
What do you think of civil disobedience in countries like Belarus or Hong Kong? Is there a risk of instrumentalization of these movements to impose one sort of liberal values? The civil disobedience in Hong Kong and where else? In Belarus, yes. Belarus, Belarus. Yes. Yeah, it is a difficult question for me uh, because of course I come from the left, but I accept fully the right of uh, people who come from the right to resist and protest and try to change regimes that perhaps would, uh, uh, would be closer to a left idea. Having said that, Belarus and I think the People's Republic of China are not particularly democratic or leftist in any sense that the European and the Latin American left would understand. So while I would say the same thing, say about a regime that I would support, perhaps the regime of uh, in Bolivia, you know, the way in which the Bolivian president was overthrown, uh, I thought was highly problematic. On the other hand, if the government of Bolivia, the government of Venezuela, which I find much more acceptable than Belarus or China, treat their own people and their protesters with guns and with massive and violent uh, repression, I have to be with the protesters. At the end of the day, power is always uh, willing to stay, is always against any change. And for me, a change that comes from the people, from the people in the streets, even against a government or a regime that I find okay, is absolutely central in my theory, in the way that I have dealt all my life with resistance and disobedience, both as a resistor myself during the dictatorship and as someone who as a lawyer and as a theorist have supported resistance. Resistance is for me, as I said, a fact, not an obligation. When people say enough is enough, I think our own obligation, my own obligation is to support them. Unless of course, it is just a little coup d'etat, uh, like it happened in Chile before the, uh, before the, the coup d'etat. It is organized, it is uh, directed, it is a way to overthrow, a, uh, in, in that case, a left-wing uh, president for the interests of outsiders. So resistance for me, in most cases, is something that has to be supported if it is massive, if it is the people who say, we, the people, want change. This for me is the biggest, the ultimate principle and every ideological uh, preference has to be, I think, placed under that ultimate principle of uh, resistance and popular sovereignty. That is the, uh, the, I think, the lesson I want to leave with you and I would be happy to answer uh, any uh, questions even through email or give you further bibliographic references. I'm happy that my email address is given to people who are genuinely interested in those uh, topics. It is important, however, at this point to state my solidarity and the solidarity of the Greek people to the Chilean people in a week that starts on the 18th and which will be extremely important in your history. We have been through that and we hope that like we, like us, the Greeks, you also will win at the end of this period. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, thank you for your answers. It was an honor to have you this afternoon with us. But um, first of all, we would like to give you a final minute to say some final words in this activity or to say goodbye. Yes, I mean, just to say that human rights are too important to leave them to the lawyers. Lawyers are key players in human rights and in legal and constitutional rights, but human rights exist and become real or they 
become dormant, they atrophy, if the people, particularly you, the young, the students, do not rise up to say enough is enough when things like what has happened over the last, uh, uh, the last period uh, happened in, uh, in a country like Chile. So I think for me, it was a great opportunity to talk to you. I have been on every major resistance activity over the last 10 years, from Egypt and Spain, to Turkey, to Brazil, uh, to the United States, uh, and many other places. I hope that the things that I was saying today, the fact that we do have a right to resistance, even if the law does not recognize it, uh, will help you believe in what you're doing and will help you go out into the streets knowing that you have with you both the spirit of history, the spirit of human rights, of morality, of democracy, but also, I think, the spirit of law and the solidarity of all people in the democratic world. So thank you very much. It was a wonderful experience. And I hope that I will be able to see you in face to face, physically, at some point in the future. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I leave you and the public with Alejandro, who is going to end this activity, first of all. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Camila. A nombre de la Facultad de Ciencias Jurídicas y Sociales de la Universidad Austral de Chile y del Círculo de Estudios de Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos, CEDID, agradecemos su participación en la Conferencia Magistral de las Segundas Jornadas Australes de Derecho Internacional de los Derechos Humanos. Agradecemos especialmente al profesor Costas Dusinas, quien desde Grecia expuso en vivo para nosotros. Y desde Chile, en Valdivia, les invitamos al segundo día de estas jornadas. Mañana, jueves 15, vamos a tener interesantes eh, paneles con los expositores que eh, van, pues, ustedes podrán encontrar en el programa completo que puede acceder en nuestro sitio web www.derecho.watch.cl. En la jornada de mañana, del jueves 15 de octubre, tendremos los paneles Derechos Económicos, Sociales y Culturales y el panel Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas. Por la tarde estaremos con los paneles Infancia y Derechos Humanos, Discapacidad y Derecho Penal Internacional. Como ya decía, mayor información y los distintos cupones de inscripción para cada sesión los encontrará en nuestro sitio web, como ya ven en la pantalla. Además, aprovechamos de invitar a todas y a todos a inscribirse a una interesante charla que tendrá lugar este sábado, 17 de octubre, una charla organizada por el CEDID, con la comisionada de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, doña Esmeralda Arosemena de Troitiño, en la primera entrega de lo que será el espacio Sesiones Interamericanas. Para mayor información e inscripciones, visite las redes sociales del CEDID, como ya pueden ver. Muy buena tarde a todas y a todos, y esperamos vernos y reencontrarnos mañana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and I would like to thank the translators who did an excellent job for me. I am sorry that I don't speak any better Spanish, but thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias, profesor. Y efectivamente contábamos con la traducción simultánea de primera calidad de eh, nuestra colaboradora, la señora Nancy Rose. Como ya decía, los dejamos invitados para poder seguir mañana con más actividades.